of Aranjir Anna Zoological Park welcomes you all for the first day session of Species Ambassador Program. This is first of its kind initiative initiated by Aranjir Anna Zoological Park towards the conservation of species. On the board, we have our zoo director, Gabasis Jana Hayafus, our deputy director, Nagar Satish Girijala Hayafus, and our eminent speaker, H.N. Kumara Sir from SACO, senior scientist. Uh, so now I welcome our deputy director, Sir Nagar Satish Girijala Hayafus, to present the welcome note for this program. A very good morning to all of you. Thank you, Shankari, for that uh, introduction. Uh, uh, I take this opportunity on behalf of uh, Arigna Rana Zoological Park to welcome uh, the director, Tiru uh, Debashish Jana IFS of Arigna Rana Zoological Park and uh, today's eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Hachan Kumara. So I take this opportunity to introduce to all the audience uh, 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 to our eminent speaker. Um, uh, so, Dr. Hachan Kumara is uh, uh, presently uh, working as a senior scientist in uh, SACON. Uh, Dr. Kumara obtained his PhD degree from the University of Mysore for his study on uh, ecological assessment of mammals in non-sanctuary areas of Karnataka. Uh, this study provided a dis distribution pattern for about 10 species and identified the potential populations for many endemic and endangered species. Before PhD, uh, Dr. Kumara involved in studies focused on the distribution of mammals, ecology, and the behavior of primates in Anamalai Hills. He studied the adaptation of uh, lion tail macaque to the changing habitat in the fragmented landscape of Anamalai Hills. He involved in the study where the male influx, infanticide, and female transfer was documented in bonnet macaque. He surveyed the nocturnal slender loris, uh, which is the species of interest for today, across its distribution range in entire South India. And uh, he also studied some of the lesser known mammal species for their status. He involved in identifying the forest areas for conservation for threatened species in Southern states. He has over 105 publications to his name and four book chapters to his credit. After his PhD, uh, Dr. Kumara was in NIAS as a young scientist. Later, he joined SACON as scientist on 1st March uh, 2010. Uh, ever since, uh, he has been working uh, as one of the eminent scientists um, associated with SACON, and he has been in continuous touch with the forest department, helping us whenever uh, we request him for the talks and uh, with his scientific inputs. Uh, on behalf of uh, Arigna Rana Zoological Park, sir, I take this opportunity to welcome you for today's program. And uh, I hope that uh, we all have a very knowledgeable and uh, interesting session to look forward to. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful introduction of our speaker. Now, I request our director, sir, the Mrs. Jana officer, to uh, present the inaugural address and to release an uh, e-booklet that we prepared for Sender Lawrence. Over to you, director, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kumara, uh, Satish, and Shankari, and everybody who is connected with us today. It's indeed a great pleasure to kickstart this initiative called uh, Species Ambassador Program, which is essentially a sequel to our Zoo Ambassador Program, which was very much appreciated by the students in particular and the public at large. Now, when the Zoo Ambassador Program uh, attempted to disseminate the uh, message of conservation to the uh, young and the adults alike. Uh, it was a generic uh, generic topic. It, it sought to send a message about the zoo, what zoos basically do, what is their role and function, and uh, how as executive conservation centers, they try to uh, reinforce and complement the efforts of in-situ conservation. Uh, on the contrary, uh, this program, which we are kickstarting uh, today, uh, the Species Ambassador Program, it uh, gives valuable insights into uh, the life and behavior of a species in focus. And uh, for today's purpose, for the beginning, uh, we have adopted uh, Slender Loris, which is a very cute and a very interesting animal. 
as you will find out from dr kumar's uh, talk uh, uh, later little later in the day and uh, i i am uh, i am sure that this program will also achieve the uh, kind of popularity and reception and encouragement that the zoo ambassador program uh, received and i would take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, shankari and her entire team for uh, uh, working really hard to make this uh, happen and uh, i wish this program all the very best and uh, as uh, satish introduced uh, dr kumara is a very distinguished and renowned uh, scientist in his own right and he doesn't need any more uh, introduction from me so without any further ado and uh, without making others wait we would rather hear him speak and uh, give us some valuable facets about this uh, species in focus namely slender loris thank you so much thank you sir for the wonderful inaugural address and hope we will be doing our job very good sir and uh, i request uh, now all the board members to uh, join for the inaugural for the e booklet release on slender loris Priyanka, can you please uh, share the booklet? You can just go around the pages, please. Scroll down the pages, please. so this booklet will be available in our zoo website under the publication uh, the species ambassador who have joined the session can uh, get the uh, get this booklet free at in our uh, zoo publication and uh, we will be providing you the link later by the session thank you priyanka we can stop sharing this so now uh, thank you the session is over to dr kumara sir kumara sir you can start with the session yes yes uh, first i would like to thank uh, uh, mr devasis jana director and uh, you know he is keep giving a uh, uh, opportunity and uh, this is uh, you know second my talk with uh, uh, in this forum and uh, thanks for the introduction given by nagar satish uh, dd azp and uh, you know uh, p shankri uh, organizing and uh, you know coordinating calling me and uh, inviting me for this forum and uh, thanks one and all for all this uh, you know invitation and giving this opportunity i will go to my you know slides now hope uh, my slides are visible now yes sir is clear yes sir okay okay in today in this uh, an ambassador program uh, uh, you know it is selected the slender loris uh, what i would like to do is uh, you know what we know about slender loris and a little bit about the primates and where slender loris stands and how the studies on slender loris started in india when it started and uh, basically the way we have walked on the research line and understanding this is slow, uh, and our loris in india that's what just today i'm going to share with uh, uh, you know little bit of a natural history and uh, uh, the effort by different people and uh, also you know facts and figures what we know about the loris 
uh, if you uh, look at the uh, primates, where the primates are found globally, basically, you know, they are not in many temperate areas. Largely, they are confined uh, to, you know, tropical belt. If you look at this is a new world primate, they are confined to uh, uh, Brazil or Latin America and Central America and Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is where the largely primates are distributed, except you know uh, one. And we have about uh, so far uh, you know 505 species are known to occur, and that's what has been described. But the description might uh, you know there is a possibility that as we explore you know, much more, and as now the new technique has come, the genetic analysis, that might help us to understand more about the species taxonomy that might add few more species also, that is also possible. And Largely, if we take the primates, the order, there are two suborders, basically steps remaining and also hatchery. If you if we look at uh, you know, our lorises, basically here they are, and uh, they are largely you know, categorized into steps remaining, especially remoridae and loricidae are forming in the steps remaining. And what is the difference between this? Stepsirini and Haplorini is a very important thing. One is, you know, uh, there is a rhinarium, the tip of the snout, there is a snout, you know, present that is absent in the other primates. And also this snout structure and uh, the skin, especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, is a characteristic and using that one, the uh, taxonomy has been done, especially in the Stepsirini. And uh, uh, the, these animals are also known as wet nosed animal because of the this particular skin, the snout. And strepsirini, the animals belongs to you know this uh, you know this category. Yeah, how it is different from this one? Basically, when we compare the uh, brain size with the their body uh, body size proportionately. Stepsirini animals have a relatively smaller brain size than the haplorini. And also, these animals are uh, having a very good uh, olfactory lobes and also amerosol organ. That is basically to communicate you know, using the pheromones. That is what is a you know, you know, very unique thing for the Stepsirini. Once it comes to India, in India, we have about uh, 24 species of uh, primates and uh, the major, where they are there, if you, if you look at, of course, there are two species, Hanuman Langur, uh, that is there, and also Rishas Maka, they are widely distributed in India. But if you look at considering all the primates together, Northeast India, and the Western Ghats are the major two uh, you know, hotspots that can, you know, that we can consider it for the primates in India. Okay, and uh, loris, uh, in India, we have uh, two lorises. One is slender loris, another one is slow loris. Slow loris is not found in Southern India, and it is largely found in forests of Northeast India where slender loris is confined to southern India. And in, in general, if you look at it, you know, what is the social organization? It is interesting to you know, know this particular part. Uh, because you know, to understand the uh, their habits and their activity, social organization is important. If we take slender lotus, basically here, yeah, usually females have uh, smaller home ranges and almost a kind of a territorial. And 
the males usually have a bit larger home range and covering territories of a, you know several females range and almost they live as a solitary if you look at it here many of such animals especially adopted for the night okay if the social organization if they have adopted to the night chances are more with the nocturnal and mostly solitary if they are diurnal especially among primates i am talking about it and it, you know they are group living if you take our you know uh, uh, macaques maybe or even langurs or even uh, the gibbons though they are not solitary but they are pair living and sometimes with a small family units so slender loris is a nocturnal animal and mostly solitary and uh, females have a separate home range and males have a overlapping home range this is a kind of a social organization system that uh, you know that slender loris is having and once it comes to being now slender loris how many species are there and the recent findings declares that now there are earlier there are there were many low, uh, you know loris sub, sub subspecies were described especially from sri lanka that is loris lidicarinus grandinus loris lidicarinus nordicus and loris lidicarinus go but now you know gamage et al could not find a genetic support for this one now this has been discarded now that means we have only two species that is loris lidicarinus loris tardigradus loris tardigradus is confined to sri lanka where loris lidicarinus is found both in you know india and sri lanka in uh, 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 sri lanka it is loris lidicarinus lidicarinus and in india loris lidicarinus lidicarinus and loris lidicarinus marbaricus so now only two species are left and uh, there are you know uh, two subspecies of uh, lidicarinus and no subspecies with the tardigradus now where these uh, you know animals stands both mysore grey slender loris loris lidicarinus lidicarinus the uh, you know uh, 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 common name for this is mysore grey slender loris for the other subspecies that is malabaricus is malabar grey slender loris both are right now in the near uh, you know threatened category it is based on the very recent uh, uh, you know you know uh, updation of the iucn status now uh, uh, you know I, i would like to you know show this photos because one can see the difference uh, in the coloration and uh, morphological variation of these two uh, you know subspecies this is one of the uh, slash slender loris my sugar slender loris and uh, i will take you to next slide where you can see more clearly for example if you take loris lidicarinus lidicarinus and the maximum body weight what so far has been recorded is somewhere around 275 where lidicarinus parinus maximum record is about 180 and probably this may be the sample you know small sample size but we may require a more detailed uh, 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 you know uh, findings on these particular aspects and also there are many uh, 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 you know features other features of the different length of the uh, uh, you know their body uh, parts and the uh, uh, body length and many other parameters also vary a lot between these two subspecies and if we put all this information together what what is an out different what for example to for an you know, circumcular patch that means the patch around the eye that is what is called circumcular patch this patch is relatively less dark 
in case of a Mysore Grace Lender Low Rise. And also, it is very thin ring. And uh, there is a uh, no, very buff colored uh, 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 line that is between the eye and the ear lobe, uh, you know, it's more whitish, that is properly visible and their width is also very high. But if you look at the same, in case of uh, Malabar slender loris, you, you can see it is much, much darker and also it is very thick and very wide. The seeing the you know, white line is you know, it's so difficult and there is a very thin line. That is what is one of the very unique uh, characteristics of these two that one can easily differentiate these two you know, from using circumcular patch. And also the head to body length, again, it is much, much larger in case of uh, my, uh, you know, my uh, gray slender lorries, that is 22.3 to 26.3 centimeter, where it is less than 22 centimeter. And as I have already told about the weight difference and also foot length, is you uh, know it is 45 to 57 may five millimeter and where foot length is 44 to 45 millimeter and basis of ventral hair usually without or seldom with the tiny gray gray base in case of lady can uh, here it is more reddish throat so if i just go back and show the color of them you can make out it is more grayish it is more dark you know reddish this is the basic difference between these two subspaces. Of course, there are many other uh, you know, things, but uh, this is, you know, is in general that we use when we see these animals to differentiate it. And identification of uh, males and females from a distance is not that easy in this case of uh, especially slender loris. If you look at the males and also females, they have both of them have a protrusions basically. And only when the male gets the proper scrotal sacs, then only it is easy to uh, make out. But even from a distance, it is not that easy. Only you know if, if they are fully grown and if the scrotal sac is visible, if it's a subadult male, that scrotal sac is not visible. And also since it is in the night and seeing a scrotal sac is also difficult. And very often we commit a mistake of by just looking at only the protrusion of penis. And uh, if we say that it is male, then in the entire area only we will be able to see males only because we may not be able to differentiate it properly with the female because of the, this structure. Usually we have to you know, have a closer look and see whether the scrotal sac is there or not, or if we, you know, uh, press just below the, you know, uh, the protrusion, then we will be able to make out whether they are male or female. Otherwise, differentiating becomes a bit complicated in case of noise. And uh, okay, so far what I about is the kind of a differentiating of it and their uh, you know habits and uh, habitats and uh, that one and okay in, in, in India when we have started exploring this animal it is a very, very interesting story that just I would like to share with you people and very long back in, uh, in the 1985 and that is the time if you uh, you know notice the literature there are only few literature was available largely uh, you know uh, quite a lot of uh, lorises were captured from the captivity it was taken to uh, laboratory in the Indian Institute of Science, then a lot of uh, uh, reproductive biology and, and uh, laboratory work was done in the analysis, uh, but nothing was documented in the field or natural condition about their population, their behavior or ecology. And later, there was a one short survey and it was uh, largely by uh, you know, secondary information was attempted even just around uh, uh, you know, Bangalore and uh, you know, Mysore uh, in this area. But it didn't really contribute to understand the, uh, you know, uh, this particular species. 
and uh, that is the uh, you know in the 95 94 that is the time the uh, mega project was launched by you know professor meva singh and uh, we were all there in that uh, team and we started studying primates in anomaly hills and uh, the major focus of the study was basically diurnal primates we were focusing on lion tail macaque nilgiri langur hanuman langur and bonnet macaque in the landscape we never ventured in the night and we never thought about study of uh, slender loris and we even we had no clue that the slender loris well, you know it's there in anamalai hills that was our understanding of loris at that particular time and that is the time uh, nakardis uh, you know uh, she's uh, she wanted to do uh, work on uh, uh, especially slender loris and she landed in uh, wildlife institute of india and many other institutes and uh, ultimately she was unable to you know get a more clarity about the loris and uh, she was directed to meet professor meva singh and then she came and she landed in mysore and she interacted and she she expressed her uh, interest that she wants to explore slender loris and uh, uh, unfortunately at that time we were very clueless and then he decided to make a trip to anomalize then they came to anomalize and uh, uh, we had a you know long uh, discussion about how to explore uh, you know slender loris in anomalize and she provided a lot of inputs that how to explore it based on her experience and uh, this is the you know kind of a discussion that we had somewhere around in 96 and uh, the first initial uh, venture was made in the anomalize that uh, you know okay we have to go in the night and we have to have a torch and we have to you know flash the light and we have to look for the animals and ultimately while exploring uh, these animals in one in food in the anomalize we, we have we were able to get uh, some uh, you know eye shine and ultimately we were conveyed that is loris and uh, that's where the study on loris was started but since you know with several days of effort there was no such promising detections or finding out any population for the study of this species then we were assigned that we to find out more details of the loris and uh, professor meva singh and nekar is left and uh, I, myself, and also uh, Dr. Anand now, uh, we were working together and we are you know, uh, exploring you know, different possibilities to find out this population. We interacted with many of the, our uh, native people in Anamala Hills and one of the persons came up with the idea, sir, we have sighted these animals in the foothills of the area, but they are very rare. But if you don't mind, you know, we, I will take you to one place where you might get a little bit of information on loris. We accepted since we had no clue of uh, uh, you know, uh, loris. And uh, yes, as per uh, his direction, we took him and we went over to one of the uh, market area. It is the local uh, market. And he took us to one you know, person who is astrologer, who tells the fortune of the people sits in the market area. And we were really surprised, you know, why we ultimately, he took us to, you know, that place. And interestingly, what was found was that he was using slender loris as a fortune teller. How in many other papers use the parakeets and uh, many other animals to pick up a thiatum or a, or a cart which uh, you know, gives a kind of a uh, uh, you know, clue to them that then he will tell based on that one that what is the fortune of that particular person. Such a kind of a, you know, uh, um, activity he used to do it and but he was interesting thing was he was using slender loris for this purpose. And the, uh, of course, then when he looked at us, our clothes and everything, he disappeared. Then uh, an hour later, we had to pull him that we are not police people or we have not come to capture him. And ultimately he was convinced Then uh, he came and sat with us and then uh, we interacted with him. Basically, we wanted to know from where he has got this animal. 
and ultimately he revealed that usually he gets this animal from one of the location in Dindigal district, especially Sirumalai foothills. That was the starting point, and this is our actually proper slender loris sighting, you know, with the Mariyappan slender loris. We always, you know, it is one of the interesting story that you uh, know always we exchange because this is where our real loris work started, and he basically planned our loris research. Then we planned, uh, uh, you know, we informed uh, Meva Singh and uh, Professor Meva Singh came and uh, we straight away went to uh, Bindigal and we interacted with the department. Department also had no clue uh, that, okay, there is a low risk and uh, then ultimately uh, different forest officers were called and they were asked, they called again ground staff and uh, very few people came up with the idea that yes sir, that we have seen the lorries and those people, sir, we will take you to a place and they took us to one barber shop, that is the meeting hall of them and that's where we had a long discussions on the different people and ultimately they took us to a, one of the smallest village and uh, 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 Kanwai Patti, and uh, then it, it was very interesting. We went somewhere by five o'clock, and uh, they have made us to sit in their farmhouse, and we were sitting there. And uh, later the boy came, and uh, then we were asking, you know, shall we go shall, uh, to see the animal? He was repeatedly saying, yes, sir, we will do it, and you sit here. And ultimately, at the end, after uh, some you know, sunset was there, he came up with the hunting you know, battery and the torch and uh, everything with the headlamp. And he came and uh, said, are we ready? Uh, shall we ready? Uh, shall we go uh, uh, to see uh, Loris? Then he said, hey, when you, st you, know, you, you can stand or you can walk around you know, or you can come behind us. Then just he stood a few meters away and he started flashing the light in his and uh, form and in the st standing from somewhere one you know in a probably uh, within a, a few meters we were able to see about six to eight slender loris in his uh, you know farmhouse especially in their mango uh, plants and also the fences around the you know their farm and we were really surprised to see that many uh, you know, slender lorries in a single flashing within a half an hour time in that kind of a landscape. And uh, that is the proper sightings of in the wild that we have got it. And uh, after that, the real survey started and uh, uh, we planned and, uh, you know, and discussed with the uh, local forest officer and uh, they gave us uh, you know, a, a, a full support and initiated the entire work and give, uh, uh, getting a permission and involving with us and supporting the entire work and uh, the survey for first uh, you know, Loris uh, work was started in Tindigar. How to survey these animals? If you look at, you know, uh, they have a uh, basically a reflector, it is a tapatium loose term that, that we see. That is a basically kind of, a, it reflects the light. And uh, if you look at here, this is the loris here, and uh, eyes are very close. And when the light is flashed on them, the, it gives the reflection, and uh, it, it, is, it is very distinct when they compare to many other animals because it is very reddish and very close by and very bright and even from a long distance, one can easily make out this animal in the night. And the survey had to be done in a, in a night since the animal is nocturnal and arboreal. And uh, we, uh, you know, we need to use a proper uh, torch or a flashlight connected to the jeep. Usually, if it is the, the you know uh, for survey purpose, we have used the uh, uh, white light because it is just only one time you know sampling and it will not really affect the animals. If it is a constant, you know, if we are flashing uh, uh, on animal, then white light is not so that way suggested. And identification from other species is based on the reflection, and uh, usually 
the existing uh, roads were selected and animal trails were selected and uh, on existing road what we have done is we connected the search light to the, our batteries and uh, vehicle was driven at a slow speed and during that uh, you know we sat outside the jeep and started flashing and then we started recording lorisas if it is on an animal trail, then have a headlamp and then you know uh, walk and search in the night and uh, get the sightings of the animal and uh, uh, that's how the survey was conducted. And uh, this is the first ever proper you know, publications on the slender low race and uh, especially about the population. This is from the uh, uh, Dindigal and uh, the, uh, here this is the about a 280 kilometer in a different forest types we have walked and uh, we were able to really get to see about 313 lotuses and uh, the encounter rate was somewhere around 1.1. It is really high. And uh, also, the uh, especially in uh, forest area with the uh, you know, uh, Carnatic umbrella thorn, Euphorbia open scrub forest, and crop plants close to the forest had highest encounter rate, means highest abundance of lorries in the Indigal. And this is the distribution map uh, uh, and, uh, for the slender lorries in the Indigal. And we continue uh, the survey uh, and over the period in the last two uh, you know, decades to different parts of the southern, uh, you know, uh, 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 southern India. And uh, this particular paper talks about the slender load distribution for the entire Tamil Nadu area. And uh, one of the uh, you know, crucial area, what you can see is Karur, and where we have walked about 6.8 kilometer and sighted nine, and the encounter rate is 1.23. It is almost equal to what we have recorded in the Dindigal. And also Pudukote, another important place for the lorries. Sivaganga, the 1.41, and uh, more interesting place is Tirchirapalli. Tirchirapalli had about 2.21. This is the highest uh, recorded uh, uh, and our detections and probably the abundance or even in the future, if we think of any uh, you know, conservation and uh, uh, you know, much more detailed uh, uh, activities to be planned and uh, that is this one. Here, Dindigal we have not included as we have done it much earlier. Dindigal is also another place where there is a high detection and high abundance. And uh, so in Tamil Nadu, and uh, uh, you know, the largely the Mysore glaze slender loris, not other you know, slender loris, that is uh, Malabar slender loris is recorded. And uh, largely if we take, uh, uh, West, this is the Western Ghats basically, and uh, only lever side, basically right shadow areas of the Western Ghats that we have recorded. And otherwise, largely it is in the Eastern Ghats of the Tamil Nadu. This is how the distribution pattern of uh, uh, slender loris in Tamil Nadu. Largely confined to the deciduous and scrub forests, and uh, as I have pointed out, these are all the major you know, places with the high uh, abundance of slender lorries in Tamil Nadu. Then we also attempted to study, uh, you know, survey lorries in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, we you know, had a good financial support and we initiated the survey and we completed the southern part of the Andhra Pradesh, especially Kadapa district, Nellore district and Tirupati district. And we were able to establish where these animals are found in what type of a habitats are you know, found. And, uh, 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 you know, but in between this study was, uh, you know, we had to stop it because of certain reason. But uh, if when it is compared to the abundance uh, in the Tamil Nadu and uh, abundance was, you know, it was uh, highest was only in the uh, Chittur district, especially Pungunur and Madanapalli area, where it is, uh, you know, about uh, one animal per uh, uh, kilometer. And uh, the, uh, when we, if we compare this population with the Tamil Nadu, uh, certain areas in Tamil Nadu had a really high density uh, of a standard load. 
though we had the financial support because of uh, at that time uh, more of a you know nationalism and since the work was during the night time many times we had a kind of attack and we had to stop it and then the work was stopped so the work could not be taken up to cover the entire uh, andhra pradesh so uh, unfortunately uh, you know uh, the entire survey work was stopped and after that there are no documentation available for slender lorries in andhra pradesh and uh, in andhra pradesh uh, you know if we, in in summary if you really look at it only uh, loris lidicarinus lidicarinus the gray slender loris is found not malabar slender loris and largely uh, you know of course the survey itself is uh, only in these three places and uh, other areas need to be really explored because this is more interesting area where we really think that this population may exist with a good popular you know good uh, density and however that requires more data and uh, uh, the especially the punganur and also madanapalli of chittur district is having a, a relatively uh, high abundance of slender loris and uh, no uh, no records or less detection of loris in kadappa shows very patchy distribution though that we have surveyed in certain area though there is a habitat but animals are not found and that makes more interesting that why they are not there are they because there are in certain patches there is no good patch and uh, if it is not there and uh, in the just adjoining patch if it is there that is actually uh, you know area to be explored then once it comes to the kerala kerala if you look at so far i was talking about uh, uh, loris uh, lidicarinus lidicarinus here we have a largely loris lidicarinus malabaricus that is the malabar slender loris that is a relatively smaller size and uh, uh, you know loris and a more reddish animal that is confined to the western ghats parts of the uh, the kerala and though the you know this species is found in this all this area but you know in the perambikulam you know landscape though we have done a really high exploration we could not really detect the malabaricus in this area that later you know i will say that why and uh, the place of uh, uh, you know high abundance is one of the places aralam you know 1.14 uh, 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 you know uh, in, uh, number of animals per the kilometer of the survey done and the nemara is uh, another uh, place where, you know 0.4 and uh, 0.6 and but here the interesting thing is in this kolongod uh, there is a lidicarinus lidicarinus and uh, where chimoni that's the place is having a uh, uh, you know malabaricus uh, malabaricus so why this kind of a thing and uh, probably you know uh, the thing is basically uh, here if you look at it there is the western uh, western ghats it has a break that's a palghat break and also here there is a, another small break and uh, Uh, in this uh, bay the uh, forest types goes to low elevation a low elevation forest of a dry forest uh, from the other side river side continues that's how in some of these places that even lidicarinus is found hey, here especially if you look at it here we have a loris lidicarinus here we have a loris lidicarinus but if we go little away in you know more of the moist area and a highly elevated area and high rainfall area the species found is basically malabaricus this is the pattern of distribution of uh, loris uh, in kerala and uh, that one was basically in the uh, northern and the central kerala and uh, southern kerala it shows the same pattern and uh, you know malabaricus is found in konni Uh, 0.5. That's what is the highest, and also, uh, uh, you know, in Tiruvannamalapuram, uh, you know, division in Puttupalli area. Again, we have a, a relatively good abundance. But if we take a overall, uh, uh, you know, abundance of the Malabaricus, they live in a low density than the uh, 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 Lidicarinus, Lidicarinus, other subspecies. 
So, in a nutshell, if we have to say, basically, uh, Malabaricus is largely confined to the Western Ghats forest and largely to uh, wet, for, uh, wet region of the wet forest, not lever side of the uh, Western Ghats. And uh, only wherever there is a, 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 a opening and the extension of the dry forest from the lever side, that's where there is a contiguity of the Lady Carinas, especially I'm pointing out between the you know, Palan Ghat and also here at the end of the Western Ghat, especially in these places, there, there is extension of the uh, relatively scrub and the uh, dry forest area. And that's where we have recorded the uh, you know, Mysore slender lorries. Otherwise, largely, if we look at it, that uh, uh, Malabaricus is confined to the uh, wet slopes and especially foothills of the Western Ghats. And the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, they are recorded up to certain elevation, though the forest is there, wet evergreen, but uh, 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 in the above certain altitude that we have not recorded this uh, you know, species, that makes it more interesting, uh, you know, to, from the point of a distribution pattern. And uh, uh, Karnataka, where, you know, we initiated the survey in 2002 and four, and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, it was a mega project. We wanted to see, you know, su su survey several species, including slender lotus. Uh, and uh, but uh, we had a limited uh, uh, you know uh, manpower and a couple of things and uh, my uh, myself and also my wife we planned uh, uh, you know uh, do the survey of slender lotus in many of these area under the supervision of uh, professor neva singh and i used to sit in that you know jeep and uh, drive the vehicle at a slow speed and she used to sit outside and uh, then uh, you know uh, flash the light and record all the data and that's how we started surveying lorries in Karnataka. What is the result of that kind of a thing? It gives the clear, you know, for the entire state, the distribution pattern we were able to come up with. For example, this is the distribution pattern of uh, Malabar slender lorries in uh, uh, Karnataka, where the uh, gray slender lorries, it was largely confined to the few districts and uh, plains of the uh, Karnataka. Especially, this is the Kolar district and the Bangalore and the Tumkur and the part of Chamrajnagar district, only few of these places. And if, uh, but later again, in some of the areas that we further explored, especially you know, Bandipur National Park and uh, Nugu, Nagarhole, and many other protected areas also we have surveyed. But in many protected areas, for example, we thought Bandipur and uh, some of these places may be connective bridge. So then there is a possibility of these species, Malabaricus and also uh, Lidicarinus, again, they maybe have a transition zone. But unfortunately, in spite of so much of an effort, there were no you know, records. But uh, uh, you know, this is all Malabaricus, largely in, in all these areas, and uh, so uh, uh, you know they live in again you know in a low density even in all the protected areas. If you really look at it, the highest was in Sharavati Valley, that is three five you know point three five, and it uh, this also indicates when we compared with the overall pattern, if we look at it, that a Malabaricus is basically living in a very low abundance than the, uh, uh, you know, gray slender lotus, especially Lyricarinus, Lyricarinus. And uh, if we take uh, again, you know, this is how the, uh, you know, the, all the detection pattern of uh, Malabaricus, and this is the detections of all the Lyricarinus, and of them, that where they are found in a really good number, again, it, it is only confined to the very few pockets, especially in Tumkur, there is a Kunigal, and Bangalore, Magadi, and Nelamangala, and Kola, and this is the Malo, this is the area is having a highest density. And even you compare now, I just I have shown in the previous slide that the uh, highest recorded of Malabar uh, slender lorries 
and is i don't know its maximum is in kerala in few pockets like aralam and other places where you know it is only one and on the other hand if you really look at it you know the litigariness you know goes really beyond that one and sometimes one per uh, one to uh, two animals per kilometer that is covered so their abundance is really more uh okay now we have surveyed uh, you know these uh, animals uh, uh, in a much larger landscape and uh, we have got certain areas with a uh, high abundance and uh, but most of these patches are again reserve forests or uh, plantations or some kind of a, uh, you know is a war exploited places basically if we have to do you know conserve these animals how to go about it and that was a kind of a question it was thought and uh, since uh, especially you know mysore glades lender lord is a largely outside protected area at least malabaricus what i have shown is largely found in protected areas and so th then if we have to plan any conservation for this one we have to have a proper understanding of this species we even with them their number so what we did is we selected some of the smaller patches go there and we, we expected especially in a uh kunigal area and kolar area where we detected some of the patches having the highest density we expected that since it was a short term and a small encounter rate we thought that in those areas if we do more effectively the work the possibility that the density may be very high we implemented uh, you know uh, the uh, distance sampling to <laughs> use uh, estimate the abundant uh, you know the density of the slender lorries experimentally initially we you know implemented this one in uh, tamil nadu the malapatti area and since we had a long term understanding of uh, lorries and we had uh, uh, you know identified all the individuals in a specific pocket then we we, we were uh, you know sure of the certain number of individuals in a fixed area so then we thought since we have a you know no population no number in the fixed area we you know laid the transects and we walked those transects and also we decided because there was also kind of a, a you know thought that the light phase also have impact on detecting these animals and estimating these populations so we wanted to test even that one whether any time of the night can be surveyed or only in a certain time that we have to survey to answer this question we walked these transects both in the evening and also midnight early morning during the dark phase moon phase and also during a light phase we walk and walk this transects you know uh, n number of time and uh, then we have got th these many detections and uh, we estimated the density of these lorises if you really look at the density of these lorises it may be evening or midnight it didn't affect the difference is very minor and also early morning or even dark phase or a light phase it really didn't affect that means detecting of lorises at any night at any time of the night is possible the study can be conducted at any time that was the kind of a clue it gave and also in addition to that one even in the night time the study can be uh, you know the distance sampling can be done for the animals like slories also you know for, uh, you know it conveys that one then using the same technique then we adopted and uh, uh, we did it in uh, karnataka as i have pointed out earlier to prioritize the areas for the conservation then we came up with the density of certain you know pockets especially ipadi and nagavalli area is having a density of 2 to uh, uh, 2.5 uh, animals that means every uh, half a hectare of the area is having one individual that means the density is 
so high. Why the density is so high is another question that we have looked at it because all other forest patches around area or other, you know, uh, probably even orchard have been cut and they have been leaving there as a refugees. And even tomorrow, if that patch disappears, there is a possibility of some of these populations also might disappear. So this may be the same case. See here, the experimentally that we have done it, but it may be, you know, it's the same situation in many other parts. Such type of a work has to be done and we need to identify the patches and prioritize the and the entire population distribution area for its conservation. I, I know it's very important. And uh, so far, whatever that I have talked about is basically distribution pattern and the abundance, density, and how to address these issues. Now we'll, I will take you to habit and uh, habitat, ecology, and behavior of these lorises. And there is a one uh, no study that, uh, you know, if you uh, look at it, uh, Mysore Wasteland Loris sightings in, uh, you know, the different forest types and animal height on the tree. Where, you know, in what type of, uh, you know, habitats they are found, if you really look at it, in certain pockets, in, if, this, if there is a deciduous forest, forest may be good, but if it is not, if it is not having a, a undergrowth, what happens is they cannot come down because they cannot go and always climb a huge tree because they are small creatures and they require a connectivity of the branches and they often come to the, you know, bushes, and the uh, herbs and the climbers where they feed largely on insects. So if certain habitats are, uh, you know, they are not really found. And also if, if there is a scrub forest, but if it is a degraded, if there is no contiguity, again, the animals may not occur. But they may occur even many other places like a villages and cultivated land. If it is connected, especially you know horticulture, uh, you know crops because mango orchards and tamarind places, and those are all if it is connected. And that is the kind of an area again these animals are largely found. And again, if you look at it, that height-wise, understanding of a height-wise use of the uh, you know, stand structure is very important. And uh, Malabaricus, if you do, take both, you know, uh, Lidicarinus, Lidicarinus, and Lidicarinus uh, Malabaricus, though the Malabaricus goes even beyond, uh, you know, 20 meters, but uh, uh, largely, if you look at it, you know, 10 meter is the highest, but maximum is less than 5 meter. That means somewhere around 15 feet. That's where animals are usually found in the forest area. If we, you know, even if the forest, whatever the strata is there, whatever the height is there, the most preferred uh, you know, place is this one. So what, this indicates that if the deciduous forest is there without undergrowth, chances of sighting them will be very less. And also, we have recorded a few other behaviors, basically. Here, just I would like to show, uh, there is a one good study it was conducted by Dr. Sindhu Radhakrishna and also Nekaris in the Ailur site. And uh, there they have really done uh, about one and a half year of a work and following, uh, identifying the individuals and uh, uh, followed them for the entire night time from the starting point, you know, uh, when they wake up and they start moving to until they go for roasting. And they have looked at these animals and documented their movement pattern, mating system, and the number of, uh, you know, uh, litter size when they gave you, and also what they eat and what is the home range, many of these things that they have documented. And uh, here is the uh, you know, information of uh, Ailur site where they have conducted. And later, again, one more study that we have conducted in the uh, uh, Malapati site. And uh, because the habitat wise, if there is a change, and how these patterns also change. One point just I would like to quote here is basically, here in the Ailu site, you know, horticulture crop was very less. And if you look at it, that insects in their diet, you know, it was 92% and plant material was seven and the gum was only two. But on the other side, if you know, uh, 
the insect was about 60% and flowers and exotics were 13%. Even they attempted to feed on 24 you know, uh, fruits and seeds uh, in a 24%. This, you know, when we have looked at many of these things, that many of these fruits and seeds had a lot of probably the you know insects and infect, insect infected so then they were also taking that entire thing uh, you know the, uh, in their diet and also some extent they also fed on a uh, different prey, prey, prey animal but if you look at it here the beetle and here if you look at it there is a gecko going inside the uh, you know there uh, as a food and this is the one you know, a very important uh, thing that I would like to point out here. And also the other aspects of uh, you know, the age of infant parking, uh, you know, is one of the things that is, you know, of the, that is the three weeks. And here it is, there is a six weeks. That's the one thing that we have recorded. Parking, I will come to parking, you know, much later. And uh, uh, usually they give a birth for twins and also singletons, both in, uh, in both the places that what uh, we have observed. And once it comes to the diets, as I have pointed out, that uh, you know insects, you know, 60 to 92 uh, percent is a comparison between those two locations. And plant materials somewhere around 2 to 30. And uh, plant material fruits and seeds, especially this one, 7 to, uh, to 4, uh, 24 percent. Animal prey is about 3 percent. By and large, if you really want to maintain these animals, the major focus has to be on insects. That's what ultimately it indicates. And once it comes to the home range, as I have already pointed out, that adult female will be having somewhere 0.9 to 1.6 hectares area. And it, it matches with what earlier I have projected about uh, an density estimation. And uh, we have recorded the one animal per hectare or one to two animal per hectare. Exactly, this also matches. This is the result from actually from the ILO area. And uh, adult male is having a much overlapping home ranges, some up to 3.3 hectares. Then there will be a chances of uh, having the home range overlap between the adult male to adult female is for somewhere around three females or four females range. And the range overlap among adult females is relatively less, between, this is between, but range overlap among males is relatively high, but that is much more high in case of, uh, it can go 0 0.3 to uh, 1.3 between males and females. So usually they give a birth, uh, you know, twice uh, in a year, that's what is this pattern. And gestation period is basically, you know, five to uh, five point to five uh, no, months. And interbirth interval is uh, seven months. And eighty uh, percent uh, they give a birth to uh, twins. That is very interesting, actually. And also. You know, weaning, uh, you know, is somewhere it starts at the five months of the age, and uh, sexual maturity of the female and male is somewhere around 10 to and, uh, 15 months. This is the kind of uh, overall pattern of their uh, reproductive pattern behavior of the animals. And uh, births usually, uh, you know, if you look at it, this is the crucial period that is uh, April and May are the two months, and where the November is the crucial time uh, for the uh, no, uh, birds uh, in case of a, uh, uh, this is Malabar, Lilicarinus, Lilicarinus. This is done in the Mysore Clay Slender Loris. This type of information is not available for the right now for the Malabar Slender Loris because Malabar Slender Loris is more interesting to study this uh, pattern as it receives this uh, uh, heavy rainfall in their habitat, and the habitat is very, very much seasonal also. That makes that makes it more uh, you know interesting to study some of these behaviors. Parking is uh, is starts at the age of uh, three weeks when they have uh, young ones and uh, it, 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 you know how we have a kindergarten and uh, 
people going for the work leave their crates, uh, even younger kids in the uh, kindergarten, and they go and they come back and they you know they feed them and they keep going. And uh, so till uh, you know when they are out, and uh, uh, usually uh, you know young ones are uh, in the kindergarten. In uh, babies are usually in the kindergarten. That's why it is called kindergarten. The same concept also exists in case of a loris. And uh, loris, they, we call it as a parking. Okay, what happens is, so there are home ranges of several females, and they may be having a one common point where many of the home ranges joins. That may be the more, I know, I know more interesting place, basically. That is the common platform they use. All the females, if they have N ones, they come and park in the such area, such particular place. That's where all these animals will be together. And once in a while, once in an hour or two, the adult female will be coming back and they feed and they go back for the foraging and uh, are rooting through the entire their home range and they keep coming in. Such places are called parking. And that is a beautiful phenomenon that is observed in uh, you know, these lorises. Here you can see you know, one loris here and loris here, and this fellow is coming out. And this is the kind of a thing that it is observed. Sometimes if we flash a light, there will be suddenly, there will be eight, 10 you know, glitters, or the eye shine will come, and you can make out that, okay, this is a parking area of the, all the females. That is a beautiful thing that can be seen with the, these lorries. Once it comes to the, uh, you know, other uh, threats, there are several threats. There is also, you, you can see that lorises are also smuggled. There are reports and also, uh, you know, that similar, uh, you know, in, information. And also very often these animals are captured and kept in a captivity and uh, uh, also used for the fortune telling and uh, these things. Roadkills are also often seen and uh, especially in, during our study itself, we have recorded so many, you know, roadkills in the area, though we have not quantified. And electrocution is also another thing that is very often seen. Compared to many of these, you know, issues, the uh, major issue that need to be addressed is basically the smuggling of slender lorises because there is a lot of pet trade uh, is behind, uh, you know, it is going out of the country and uh, this is the one of the issue that need to be uh, uh, not considered as a threat. And uh, this is uh, another point just I would like to say here. But what happens is when they see young ones, people come, they capture it and they think that they are you know, alone and they bring it to the zoo or the forest department or they hand it over to the different people. But that practice has to be curbed and people should not capture these animals. They have, or if they have captured, they should be encourage or educated to leave you know wherever they are there because very often lorises in, 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 in the lorises they leave their in ones when they are going and even sometime in the morning also you know they come late and by the time you know early morning when the people go there they see these animals they pick it up and they and then they hand it over so this this indicates that need a good amount of uh, education programs and uh, 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 you know, reaching the local people, people who are around the habitats of uh, loris is very important. And the name you know, of the loris is very, very interesting because since it is a kind of an obscure and a nocturnal uh, animal, and different communities have different names for uh, you know, this animal. Here, just I have put several names, and uh, just I would like to say that why these people have kept this name. That is very interesting. Adavi here, a manushya. Adavi means it's like a forest. It's a man of the forest. Malay manushya. Malay means again the hills, and uh, you know the uh, man. Malay means uh, basically it is for the Malabar slender loris. Adavi manushya is usually for the uh, I know, uh, 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 gray slender loris, miso slender loris. And Kado Papa, it is like they consider it as also baby. Kado is a forest, it's a baby of the forest. And that's how the name is given. 
and uri yolo uri yolo it is in southern uh, you know of uh, uh, coastal areas of the karnataka yolo means basically uh, ice and uri means it is like a burning eye the animal having burning eye is slender lodis so animal name is uri yolo here is a nyala or bada nyala this is the northern part of the again coastal belt having a different name nyala means it's a very slender animal that is like even in tamil what we have tevangu teva means it's a slender animal and here it is like it's almost a similar name in kannada that one is bada nyala means it is Uh, really it is like uh, you know very dried or uh, you know it is not having any food and that's why it is very slender animal that's how this is called sometime even bananaana and kaipei kaipei is very interesting it is like a ghost of the forest because many of these hunters and many of these animals say you know have a kind of a feeling that is ghost of the uh, you know uh, uh, animal it is in malayalam and bidrumele chigare or bidrumele chigare they say that both of uh, you know these uh, these terms bidrumele bidrumele means it's a bamboo and chigare means it's a deer of a deer on the bamboo because the it can run you know very swiftly on the uh, you know uh, bamboo bushes where, where other animals cannot do it chigare means very intelligent you know girl basically the, who, you know it, uh, you know in on bamboo again it is very intelligently it manages to uh, you know escape that's why it is also called as bidrumele chigare alavu it is another name basically again it say, it says that it is like a you know slender animal and so if you look at it you know it the local names has come with uh, so much of uh, information and people you know different people and different have uh, their attachment and uh, it it connects the animal to the area and i found it is more interesting so i thought it, it is you know worth sharing with all of you people and with this i will end my talk and here it is professor meva singh who really initiated the uh, all the studies on slender lorries and uh, the initial survey was done with uh, you know dr anand kumar and uh, sindhu radha krishna she is now a scientist uh, a senior person in nias she did the first proper uh, phd study on uh, uh, you know in the uh, field on their ecology and the behavior aspects that is in ilo this is nakaris and uh, again you know she did a phd in ilo and uh, 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 shashi he is the one has surveyed uh, all part of uh, uh, kerala and also tamil nadu he is doing his uh, uh, current post doctoral work again in uh, uh, tamil nadu especially on acoustics of uh, slender lorries and chantala uh, surveyed karnataka part and uh, my kids have accompanied in many places uh, to see the these animals and many of the, uh, the sketches and uh, interpretations and the stories it was created by uh, nivedita and uh, other person is ashwin who helped in you know, documenting many of aspects of uh, you know basically photograph you know, uh, you know documentation and also helping in the night surveys that is ashwin so i thank all of them and thanks for giving this opportunity i am now open to the question thank you thanks a lot thank you sir for a really a wonderful presentation and uh, you have taken us through the entire aspect of center lorries with a wonderful diagrammatic presentation sir uh, now we move on to the questions that we have uh, got to the youtube uh, chat and uh, yeah i mean it is also there in the chat box and uh, there is a general question from rupesh rupesh want to know what should we do to become a zoologist what pardon zoologist uh, what, should, what should we do to become a zoologist to to go into to become a zoologist what we have to study or uh, what the things we have to do uh, it just not to know 
in our in indian system as you know then our conventional uh, uh, education system where we uh, for example if i take you know i uh, you know my, my example i studied you know, as uh, uh, science in uh, plus 1 and plus 2 and then i took a bsc uh, that's where the life science then uh, msc zoology but now uh, you know to become a zoology especially you uh, know uh, it gives a much more wider uh, scope even one can study even zoology and many other aspects of the zoology and also even wildlife but if you select at the msc level only focus on the wildlife biology what happens is you will be narrowing down to only wildlife then getting into other field will be difficult if the entire focus is on wildlife biology and then it is fine otherwise i you know i prefer going to msc zoology that's how we can get it so uh, most of the indian um, uh, conventional universities and also many of the even uh, even recent icers and other institutes also give a degree in life sciences that's how one can get into the uh, uh, field of life sciences uh, in overall zoology Thank you, sir. I think your Rupesh has got the answer. And there is a question from Rishwan: How many types of lorises are there? How many types of lorises are there? The uh, one is uh, slow loris. Another one is slender loris. Lo uh, sl slow loris is different from a uh, slender loris because the name itself says okay. There are two different uh, you know species altogether. I uh, already have conveyed in uh, my uh, earlier uh, you know slides the uh, slow lorises are uh, in india it is confined to northeast uh, uh, area forests of northeast and also southeast asia and the slender loris is totally confined to southern india and also sri lanka again only two species are there in the slender loris one is uh loris tardigradus another one is loris lidicarinus loris lidicarinus is having further two subspecies that's what i have talked about it hope i think i have answered yes sir and uh, the next question is from ranjit kumar is there any characteristic difference between malabar and mysore slender loris and also explain the importance of slender loris in food chain yeah i think i have actually my entire talk many slides talked about the same of differentiating malabar slender loris and also uh, uh, you know gray slender loris mysore slender loris probably once this you know talk is uploaded or later available you can go back to those slides and you can see it how morphologically they vary and also how you know the habitat wise also they vary and uh, the, their entire niche is you know entirely different that i have clearly told but in a brief i would say you know uh, gray slender loris is body size is much larger and than the uh, malabar slender loris malabar slender loris is more reddish and having a circumpolar eye patch is much more you know wider than the uh, uh, gray slender loris okay this is the major difference that you can see it genetically that work has to be done i think very soon it will be done so then we will be understand this the difference between these two in much more detail very soon okay in the, in the, see every species has evolved on this earth uh, you know in the over the period it is not there and you know, right now we have disconnected so many chains and then we think sit and think that where it fits that is our mistake actually because we, we don't know what the damage that we have done it uh, everything you know if we have to look at from our own angle okay what is the importance it's very difficult to say that much. but if you really look at it and they are the good you know uh, from the point of ecology or farmer friendly animal because they don't eat much on the fruits and they don't do the any damages to the you know the horticulture crop or any other crop but they are very friendly why i am telling friendly largely they feed on insects which are really going to damage their crops they also we, we suspect that they feed more largely on the fruits with having more insects or uh, uh, borers or some kind of a thing so that even they clean those things so in that process they also eat those insects so it is one way that they clear basically the uh, 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 
you know insects uh, help the farmer so then it reduces or it increases the their production okay and uh, so in the food chain if you look at it yes insects are eaten by slender lorries of course insects are uh, you know again eating some other thing and it comes from uh, different sources we, that way we can bring it to the food web and uh, though we don't know that the next level of a chain because we have been you know talking about it whether is a snake is a predator or owl is a you know predator uh, that still need a much more uh, you know uh, exploration so then we can construct the complete food chain uh, uh, you know link you know keeping the lorries in the center thank you sir and uh, the next question is from harini uh, she has that is uh, which species is considered as most endangered and uh, what is the reason i will repeat again sir uh, in lorries so in danger yes uh, i know that, that, that's what i have pointed out and uh, it is a near threatened and uh, uh, so uh, yeah, one of the species that's a uh, you know red slender lorries in uh, sri lanka is considered as uh, the endangered or a near the, uh, probably vulnerable species because the uh, their habitat occupancy is very small and also uh, you know it uh, spatial distribution and also the habitat is highly vulnerable uh, the, the only that particular sri lankan species is considered you know in the category otherwise other uh, slender lorises are not in the major category thank you sir and the next next question is from vishnu uh, the diet or social behavior of a same species is having a variation based on the location and i just want to know why there is a variation in in the diet or in social behavior Uh, oh, that variation because see availability of resources vary, and uh, also uh, the social organization because availability of a habitat also vary. If there is a contiguous habitat available, okay, then the uh, and also if it is a larger patch, what happens is the density will be much lesser. as they are forced so probably the fragment size is small and if they are highly packed in the area the competition for the resource goes high that's the competition i, I know ultimately leads to their adapt understanding their adaptability meet the plasticity so if there is a less resource available if there are too many animals are there the, uh, you can see that much wider range of uh, their diet than when there are lot of things are available the, you usually they become very selective so that's what is that you know the pressure but even we want to see that one in a exploring a much more different type of a habitat so then we will have a more clarity and we will be able to understand the total plasticity of this animal or the total you know diet uh, spectrum we will be able to get it yes the question has got his answer and uh, there is a same for uh, another question from him like uh, he just want to know what does the term isosexual means iso means basically when they give a birth for the twins usually the sex of those uh, individuals it will be almost uh, same that's what is that okay and uh, there is a question from rev uh, revati uh, do hunters hunt slender lorries for trade do hunters hunt slender do hunters hunt slender lorries for trade they don't hunt they capture it hunting is basically you know you are eliminating them and uh, you, know, you are killing them it is not a you know they they properly they capture it and uh, you know they take it in a cage and uh, then the smuggling uh, happens and that's where the confiscation happens and the animals are brought into the zoo or it was taken to different places that's what happens. Uh, the next question is from Aditya sir. So he has like, how should we protect lorries? How should we protect lorries? Basically, already we have submitted 
uh, several of these things uh, to, to the different uh, uh, LO department. First one is, uh, uh, you know, apart from uh, 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 department, what they do it means the increase in the protected area or having the conservation reserve or different. That's a different aspect. If we keep it that aside, then what as a common people, you know, we can address this issue. See, one thing I have pointed out, people, local people have to be first educated where the animals are there. So then they don't really eliminate them or unnecessarily they don't capture these animals and then you know, they're taken away. So it will have a big impact on the, their population size. So, so that is the one level of the thing. And also retaining of the, uh, you know, these patches and even through it may be horticulture or it may be other kind of a plantations. It is very important because ultimately fruits are not important here. The insects are important. In any of these habitats, insects will be there. So even any plantations, insects will be there. So food does not become a problem. Here, what problem is basically it because it cannot jump. It is always required if it has to move, uh, you know, from a tree to tree or any kind of a thing. The connectivity is important because the branch is important. With the branch only, it moves. It cannot jump. So once the you know good patch with the connectivity is there, they thrive. You know, we no need to do anything if we are provided only these two aspects. If people are not removing these animals and there is a patch available and if there is a connectivity with the proper connectivity, animals will survive. We don't need to do anything. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, that's the question that we received. And uh, now I hand over the session to our Deputy Director, Nagasatish uh, Grijala, sir, to present the vote of thanks. Uh, again, uh, good morning to all of you, sir. Uh, it's been a wonderful session, sir. We have gotten a lot of aspects with respect to slender loris. It's a very cute animal. We have only two lorises in our zoo, and we recently got the third one. Uh, so every time we speak to you, it's it's really an enriching experience for uh, you know not just the audience but even for the zoo management. Uh, as you know, sir, zoos are basically ex situ conservation centers. And uh, we try to create a, you know, as natural habitat as possible in our environment uh, for, the, uh, for the inmates of the zoo. Uh, but for this to happen, we need to know, you know how they actually live in the wild. You know? uh, we need uh, scientific uh, information, you know, how, how, how they live in the wild, you know, what is their dieting pattern, what are the biological aspects of them, you know, what, what, and what conditions they breed. And all these things. And uh, slender loris is being a nocturnal animal. I mean, I was very amazed to see the kind of surveys, you know, the transacts you have walked and uh, the kind of surveys you and your team has done. It's, it's really, uh, I, I, I felt very, you know, I felt like going back to my, uh, uh, my academy days. It's, it's wonderful, sir. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll, we'll actually do, you know, one more survey along with you, you know, physically. Uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Arignarana Zoological Park, I take this opportunity to, to thank you, sir. And uh, we invite you as well as uh, the species ambassadors, you know, who, you know all the participants who are uh, present today to the zoo. Once we reopen, we invite you to the zoo. You kindly visit our enclosures, kindly suggest us, you know, you know first-hand uh, suggestions with respect to the enclosure designs or, you know, how do we make the uh, ex situ conservation program of these animals, you know, uh, in more en enhanced. So I, I thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Uh, I thank the zoo educator also for uh, arranging this uh, interesting session and uh, uh, coordinating with sir and coordinating with uh, multiple people uh, to make this happen. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, from our side. And we hope that uh, we interact with you further on uh, multiple uh, topics in future also. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank one and all. And especially thank you and uh, Satish also and uh, Jana also once again. And as you pointed out that you have received the slender loris and uh, probably managing slender loris in captivity is very tricky and uh, hope uh, you, know, you will be doing that. And if it is any suggestions or any things required, probably later that we can you know, think of it and we can discuss on it. And thanks for giving this. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.